Aloha. Aloha and welcome to the Eco Tour of Hawaii for the National Storytelling Network's Earth Up Celebration. My name is Jeff Gear and I'm your host. So let's begin with this. Where is Hawaii? Hawaii is the farthest, most remote land mass from every other land mass on the globe. You've got to fly five hours at least to get there from any other place. It's had millions of years of isolation to create a fragile ecosystem of spectacular beauty and the most unique plants and birds on the planet. Its native species have no thorns. It's a collection of eight islands, volcanic. Kauai has the Waimea Canyon, the Grand Canyon of the islands, and the Kalalau Valley that you've got to hike into from the end of the road at Haena. We'll visit them at the end of the program. Oahu is the capital and the economic center, features Waikiki and Pearl Harbor and the big waves on the North Shore. Maui has Lahaina's whaling town and the Haleakala volcano crater. The Big Island of Hawaii features an active volcano and it's the home of the goddess Pele. So let's just orient ourselves to the eco-disasters that everybody in Hawaii knows about. Now, in 1826, there was a whaling ship. They were upset because the authorities wouldn't let them land. Some say because they were such drunkards that they ran havoc all over town. Some say because they wanted to catch a woman and take her onto the ship. At any rate, they were mad. And so they took a barrel full of infected water with mosquito larvae and put it ashore. Ha, ha, ha. And that's how Hawaii got mosquitoes. Now, forever, there were the indigenous birds and the migrating birds, but there was no way to put the two together until the mosquito came. The mosquito started biting the migrating birds, then bit the native birds, infected them with diseases. They had no tolerance. They died. Now, to the elevation where mosquitoes stop breeding is too high, there are native birds. But my friends high up on Mount Oloa say that now they're starting to get mosquitoes so that the planet is warming and the mosquitoes are coming higher and higher, which means that they'll infect the native birds. Well, you know what happens then. Hawaii was known to have 60 unique species of birds on these islands, some with beaks that went to a particular flower to get a particular nectar for food. Well, from those 60, there are 17 left and all of them are endangered. And what about Hawaiians? Captain Cook is credited with discovering Hawaii in 1778, and right along with him, he brought venereal diseases. Soon, other explorers brought the common cold and flu. The Hawaiians were defenseless. Whalers brought alcohol, and missionaries brought a new god, their Bible, and the written word. Hawaiians were dying at alarming rates. Cane barons brought capitalism, and by the time the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown, where one Hawaiian stood, nine had died already. And of those native Hawaiians that survived, we now find that they all have Chinese blood, which came with resistance to infections. Cattle. 1794, Captain Vancouver gave a gift to Kamehameha I of four bulls and eight cows. And he placed a kapu on them, no can kill them, let them run wild, and they did. They ran for 40 years until 1848. Finally, that kapu was lifted by Kamehameha III, who brought in vaqueros from Mexico to teach the Hawaiians how to catch these wild animals that were running havoc over the native forests, eating everything, trampling things, and goring people, truly. They said that in 1846, there were 10,000 semi-domesticated cows and 25,000 that were wild, very wild cattle still carve out the uplands of the Big Island. You know, in Hawaii, Cain was king and great fortunes were made from the 1800s through the 1900s featuring sugar cane. The Union soldiers all ate CNH sugar, California and Hawaii, CNH sugar. Cane was money, 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 baby. But there was one problem rats. Rats were eating too much of the cane. So, some ingenious guy in 1872 brought in 72 mongoose from Jamaica, thinking they would eat the rats. But there was only one problem 
The rats are nocturnal. They only come out at night. And the mongoose sleeps at night and comes out during the day. So what were they to do? The mongoose feasted on native birds and eggs, helping to wipe out all the indigenous birds. You still see them around. What a catastrophe, rats and mongoose. Here's another one. If you go to the big island, especially around Hilo, especially in Pahoa, or up in Kurdistan, the nights are full of the sounds of the koki, 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 koki frog, koki frog everywhere, koki, 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 koki. They can be loud. What are they? And how did they get here? Well, they're brought in in the 1980s on the underside of nursery plants, some say Christmas trees, from Puerto Rico, where they breed and love them. Well, they don't love them in the big island. And they're spreading across the big island, and I hear there's an infestation now in Waimanalo and Oahu. Koki frog. They're the size of your fingernail, like a dime. Underside of the leaves, can't see them, can't find them, sleep during the day, and just chirp, 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 chirp all night. Now we got Koki. <laughs> ah, hi. I want to introduce you to my friend Dawn Wasson. She's gone from this world since 2018. Good friend of mine, active, vehement, Hawaiian to the core and what she called a recovering Mormon. She lived in Laie on grounds that her grandfather got in the Great Mahele. There was no such thing as private ownership in the traditional Hawaiian society. So they set up a system whereby anybody who was working on land with two people to attest to it could pay a small fee and become the owner of the land. But of course, because the Hawaiians had never had land ownership and had never done such a thing, lots of the land that they were working on was taken out right from under them and sold to white developers. Thus came the cane industry. Now about that time came the Mormons too. Oh, the Protestants and the Catholics were not happy. Finally, after struggling in the 1850s, 65, 1865, they bought a big parcel way out on the very farthest edge of Oahu, Laie, Laie, of all places where they could be in peace. A lot of people, Hawaiians particularly, who had been dispossessed of their land, joined the Mormon church and farmed Kalo, Taro, in the land of Laie. Well, subsequently, the sugar was started to develop there. That's how they made money. And subsequently, they built a giant temple there, one of the seven internationally for the Mormon church, the Church of Latter-day Saints. And then the temple led to a BYU, Brigham Young University, Hawaii campus to educate all the Polynesians who came there. And eventually, all those students from all those different Polynesian countries represented their cultures, their native cultures, in the Polynesian Cultural Center, the biggest tourist attraction destination in the state today. And they run buses from Waikiki out there all the time, put on a big nighttime show. It's quite a development, quite an event, and quite successful. Back to Dawn. The Polynesian Cultural Center had too much uh, sewage, so they put it in the stream that ran by our house. She sued them. She won over a couple million dollars. When I saw her, I said, Dawn, congratulations. You just won the settlement. You got your, your money. Yeah, but a mixed blessing because I can't farm and use the water from the stream for two generations. I wonder how a consciousness can develop of that sort. She told me the story. Her grandfather was one of those Hawaiians who actually did go through the process and owned his own land in Laie. Well, the Mormon church was looking for a place to expand to build their temple. And one day as he was working in his field, he looked over and there was a elder who came over to him and said, how much of this land around here is actually yours? Well, it runs along the stream and it goes up to the mountaintop over there and across the ridge to that big fork the big stone there, back down to the river. Oh, that's my land. Oh, that's too much land for a poor Hawaiian like you to be owning. I think we need it. And according to Dawn, her grandfather said, watch me. 
this poor Hawaiian's going to go in his poor little house over there and he's going to get his poor shotgun. And if you're still on his poor land, he's going to shoot you. The man ran off. A couple of weeks later, that poor grandfather Hawaiian was picking in his fields, doing his work as a farmer. And he looked over and he saw that same Mormon elder with a surveyor surveying his land. And that grandfather of Don Wasson's walked into his house and got his shotgun and <laughs> fired it off into the air. <laughs> Whoa, they all ducked down behind the, the boulder. And he said, what are you doing? He says, you're on my land. I told you to go. The next time I see you here, I'm going to shoot that head of yours off. The elders yelled out, you're excommunicated. And according to Dawn, her grandfather said, that's fine. Now the land is my God. That's Don Wasson. That's her grandfather. And that's the story I want you to take home. I don't know how many of you know this about me, but I, Jeff Gear, was once the city and county of Honolulu's Department of Parks and Recreation drama specialist. That's right. I was not always just the handsome face before you now. I was a professional. <laughs> and working with me at those times over those many, 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 many years was a guy named Alan Hong. Who is Alan Hong? Well, Alan Hong was the manager of Hanama Bay. Hana meaning bay, Uma meaning the curve, so the curving bay, Hanama Bay. Elvis played there in the blue Hawaii. And in the 1980s, it was so popular at 9,000 people a day that a University of Hawaii study said that it was the place people loved so much it was killing the reef. They would feed peas to the fish that you could buy in the concession stand and the fish grew goiters and weird anomalies out of the side of their bodies. The reef was dying. So that study by the University of Hawaii led to a management plan in 1991, and they hired Alan Hong to implement that management plan. The management plan said, one, you gotta stop feeding the fish. Two, you gotta stop walking all over the reef. Three, we gotta cut down the amount of people. Four, we gotta make the people that come know more about how to preserve the reef that they come to love. So Alan basically worked out of his white VW van and lived and breathed and sometimes slept at Hanama Bay and forced the tourist industry to comply with the mandates of that plan to save the resource of the bay and preserve it for posterity. That was not an easy thing to do. There was a lot of money at stake and people were selling tourism packages, many, many dollars. They were now dropping them off. So he had to put guards up there and he had to turn people away. And there were fist fights and screaming matches and cars running down workers and him. And he held his ground. They complained to the mayor and he went to the city council and he argued that the resource needs to be protected. And guess what? Finally, he got them to pass an ordinance that if you go against these rules, we'll assess you a $500 fine. So the tourist industry stopped pushing on him. And the bay now is pristine with two days off every week, a controlled amount of parking, and tour buses come in, but they stay on the top side in the buses area, and they all unload, take their pictures, get back in the bus, and go out of the park. All the fish now eat what they ate without the people, and it's a beautiful, pristine resource. And I'm proud of Alan Hong for the work that he did there. Now you know a little bit about it. A hero in our midst. <laughs>